Hello and welcome everyone to the Ryerson University, Ted Rogers School of Management International Sports Spotlight. It's our series where we continue to talk to top industry leaders in the sports business. My name is Chris Schufeld, Vice President of Business Operations at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. Today, I'm lucky to be joined by the first athlete we've had uh, on this panel in, in our series, Justin Morrow, who's a defender for Toronto FC. Welcome, Justin. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Thanks for having me. I didn't know I was the first. I'm happy to be the first. So it's nice to be the first one. For, for, first professional athlete. I think I may have just offended so many <laughs> others that I've talked to on this podcast because I, in some way, shape, or form, they've been athletes. The first professional athlete. There we go. Yeah, I don't care what it is. I'm just thinking first. I'm not, it's all I got. Yeah. Stuff in there, so. there, there you go. So, um, Justin, when, when we were putting together the um, the podcast and the speakers, we thought it was really great to to have different perspectives um, that uh, we wanted to talk to, and whether it was business leaders, whether it was athletes like yourself, uh, people who have been involved in various different aspects of the industry. So today, I think we're going to focus a lot on leadership, and and uh, you know, you've led on the pitch, winning championships. And then now the transition, um, which you've gone through over the last, let's say, 10 months in your very important role as executive director of Black Players for Change. So we're excited to learn about that endeavor and, and everything that's gone into, into that. You and I have been talking a lot over the last number of months about this specifically. So uh, I think there's a lot of important work you're doing, and, and uh, that's what we'll, uh, we'll get into today. Awesome. So I'm gonna first set the table with a little bit of your bio. So everybody, the students uh, and everybody watching will understand who exactly Justin Morrow is, at least from the, from the bio. And then, and then we'll tell some stories along the way. So Justin Morrow is a 12 year veteran of Major League Soccer and current defender for Toronto FC. He's known as a defender who can get into the attack. He's contributed to multiple trophy winning teams over the course of his career. Most notably being a key member of the rise of Toronto FC over the past eight years, and currently our second longest serving member of the club. I think it's 186 matches. Um, capturing three Canadian championships, a domestic treble in 2017, which included the MLS Cup, and in the same year was named to the MLS Best 11. Justin has represented his country, the US, in international competition, most notably winning a CONCACAF World Cup in 2017. Before turning professional, he graduated from the University of Notre Dame where he studied finance, which sparked an interest in business. Over the course of his career, he has employed his affinity for business and passion for community development through continuing education, as well as program implementation in Toronto. In addition to playing, Justin currently serves as the executive director of Black Players for Change, a nonprofit organization tackling racial equality and social justice in Major League Soccer. For this very important work, Justin and his other directors at the Black Players for Change were awarded with the 2020 MLS Humanitarian of the Year Award. Uh, Justin provided some of his bio, but he didn't provide some of the, the he's very, <laughs> he didn't provide some of the other stats. So I added, I beefed it up a little bit. Hopefully that was okay, Justin, but I want to make sure uh, I gave you the, the, the full welcome here, so. Yeah, thank you. That was great. I, I try and keep it top line, but that was very nice of you. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's uh, let's start. I, I'm going to structure this podcast a little bit different than some of the other ones we've we've done, and some of the other ones I've started specifically with, you know, right into the pandemic and and leadership through through that phase. But I want to go back a little bit with you and talk first about some of your playing career, and then get mm -hmm. into the pandemic and, and everything that's that's been um, that's been since. So you grew up in Cleveland in Ohio, and then you made the journey to one of the most iconic. U.S. schools in uh, in Notre Dame. So I'd I'd love to hear about your experience and some of the things that maybe you learned through going to school at that institution and how it prepared you for that next jump to eventually become a professional athlete. Um, it's interesting because as a professional athlete, um, it was very consistent with what you would expect or what you would imagine of uh, an American. And I say that because the sport of soccer, football is so global. And usually throughout the world, players take a much different path than Americans do to professional sports. But mine was very linear. It was very, you know, start playing at a young age, do well, carry that into high school, did well in high school, did well um, academically in high school, got me to Notre Dame, did well at Notre Dame and 
and I got drafted. Um, but then when you when you look at it, um, I think the things that I struggled with throughout my high school years and my college years um, were just finding my my feet and finding where I fit in. Uh, I was I was a top player in Ohio growing up, top prep player. Um, I went to a school, a prep school that is kind of like a feeder into these big elite schools. Um, so it was like, I think there was myself and, and maybe five other athletes coming from my high school to Notre Dame. And then on top of that, we had another like 10 students from the, from the high school going to Notre Dame. So it was like, it was like, that was what was demanded out of kids out of this high school. Right. And, um, I was well prepared in a lot of different ways, but um, the jump from sports in high school and in Ohio to Notre Dame was a big jump because um, Cleveland's a small place, you know, and you're not getting the exposure that you are in some of these bigger states uh, like California or Texas and, and Florida. And so you get to Notre Dame and you're just exposed to a whole new level, level of soccer um, kids from all over and I did a fair amount of traveling in high school and club soccer but it's just a whole different level um, so I struggled to make the jump there they didn't play so much um, my freshman year um, and just struggled to find my footing in the team but then I think the thing that Notre Dame does well is um, it's it supports you it supports their student athletes on a lot of different levels um, they make very well-rounded student athletes and I think everyone has that in the back of their mind when they're going to a school like that. And there's lots of resources. And so once I understood, you know, what it meant to be a college student athlete and found my footing, then I you know, really started to excel. And Notre Dame was a big help in that because their, their tradition, their aura, their spirit around the school is, is huge. Right. And all of that feeds into your experience and the way people go when they, when they think they're going there, you know? And so it was all around great experience, um, kind of a typical college experience in that um, I wasn't I wasn't killing it right away. I had to fight through that. And that set up the stage for me being professional because again, it was the same thing when I became a professional, I had to fight again. And so each level, you know, making the jump and having to fight every time, I think there's something to be said about that. One of the, one of the best things that, um, I could say has made me successful in my career is being a learner. Um, I'm always astute, um, you know, taking in every single thing, every detail around me. And if you have that attitude, if you have that growth mindset that you're always trying to get better, always trying to be better than you were the next day, or always trying to be better than you were the year before, um, then you'll, you'll be going up like this. Because I know so many athletes that were, you know, top of their game in high school or even before that, that you just don't hear their name anymore. And even the ones in college that were all American in college that did so well and you just, they never made it to the pros or they made it for a year and didn't stick around or whatnot. So I've always um, tried to bring that over my decade plus in the league, and keep that consistent. And I think that's what that jump from high school to Notre Dame really did for me. Was there ever a time when you were at uh, Notre Dame where, you know, you thought the professional athlete route was was maybe not achievable and you were going to have to fall back on your school or did you always feel like you had like was it in your it was in your mind you talked about mental toughness there um but did you have those doubts like what what, what were you thinking as you were going through I did I did have the doubts um so my I went I studied finance at Notre Dame and I studied um I got there in 26 and left in in uh in December of 20, 2009. And so obviously in that time was a financial crisis, right? And so it was like, for someone who has no investment in the market, it was exhilarating. Like you're just there watching every single day what's happening. The teachers are teaching live in time, you know, sometimes we would just put on the news, watch the news and they would teach off of that. And um, so investment theory, corporate finance, all of these classes that I took here were so interesting to me at the time. Um, and then also at a, at, a, at a university like that, I mean, Mendoza was, was number one. They were the number one ranked business school when I left. And so it's super competitive. And so I'm getting towards the end of college. I'm not an All-American. I've had a good career. Um, my coaches think very highly of me. 
my coaches are influential, so they get me places. But I'm also having that doubt in my mind. Like, ah, I don't know if this is going to work out for me, right? Um, so the potential was there to, to go professional. I had all the tools. I had the people that believed in me that I could do it, but I just didn't know. And in the meantime, I'm seeing all my peers get summer internships and at Deloitte and, and KPMG and Ernst Young and, and um, all of these, you know, JP Morgan, J, all these big banks and, and uh, accounting firms. And meanwhile, I'm like throwing my heart and soul into, into soccer in the summertime, training extra. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. So I remember it coming down towards towards the end. And I remember even doing interviews. I mean, I, I interviewed for um, an FP&A role at Abercrombie Fitch at the headquarters in Columbus. I interviewed at Key Bank. And luckily, those those didn't work out. They weren't <laughs> interested. Um, I went into the, the combine and did well at the combine. And it was after that, it was, it was always up and up. But um, I even remember a time after my second year when I hadn't been playing much in the league. And my wife, you know, we had been doing long distance. Um, she she was in a rotational program in a Fortune 500 company on the East Coast. So she was getting all this incredible experience, uh, making more money than me at the time. And I was like, you know what, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm done with the soccer thing. I'm going to. I'm going to study for the CFA. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a test and that's going to kind of pull me back into the industry. And right towards the end, luckily in, in 2011, our team was just having a poor year and we were knocked out of the playoffs super early on in the fall time. And so I was able to get a good run of games. I think I got like 10 games. You know, they were willing to just try me out and see how it went. And I did really well. And that set everything up for, for, 2012, which was a great year, really launching back from my career. It's it's amazing how things work out and how close you know you are to to going out the other way. And you know the 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 rise of Major League Soccer over this time when you were starting to get into the league as well was was starting to change. But when you when you first come in, there's there's still a lot of work to go. And I mean, we're certainly on that growth pattern right now. And there's 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 more work to do. But <clears throat> it's amazing how close how close that decision is, right? Um, so it's the mental yeah. toughness, sticking it out, right? Believing in yourself. Yeah, right? perseverance. Yeah. yeah, I know they're, they're cliche, but that's, it's the reality. It's the truth of, of, you know, some people being, you know, going on to have amazing careers or or maybe maybe there's, you know, some of your peers that had amazing careers and are in business right now, same, same boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's a, the one thing you said there, which was really interesting, teaching in the moment, you know, you, you, your teachers and profs are dealing with the financial crisis, but I just wrote that down because right now during the pandemic, we're going through the same thing where there's no playbook for, you know, in business, what we're going through. And, and uh, I, I know that, uh, you know, some of the, the professors and, and uh, business leaders out there, they're doing the same thing right now. So it, it hasn't mm -hmm. dawned on me necessarily too much to the financial crisis. That, but when you mentioned that, I'm like, you know, this is very similar to what, what we're going through now. So it is, time... it is. I mean, it's a time like on any other and it's, yes. it, it presents opportunities. All crises present opportunities too. So you have to think of the positive things as well. Exactly. So you, you, uh, you enter into, um, into major league soccer after, after your career and, um, you know, you, you played, I guess during college, you were playing in some PDL clubs as well. And then you enter into major league soccer, those, those early years and, and the drive to keep going. How did you approach, uh, mentorship and and was there some people along the way that you know kept your your focus and your drive as a young athlete it's hard to make that transition uh in into the professional ranks and i'll parallel that with business um you know when you're when you're trying to make that transition into the business world having key mentors or people that you look up to is important so how, how did that play out in your career um yeah, my, my mentors go, I mean, they're a part of me. They're a part of my foundation. Um, I came into a club with some established players in my position. And most notably, Ramiro Corrales, who um, at that point had been in the league 15 years. Um, he was in a, an MLS original, um, one of the, to this day, one of the best soccer players that I've ever played with, just a pure soccer player. Um, 
guys like Jason Hernandez, who are, um, you know, these larger than life figures uh, and is still working at Toronto FC to this day um, and still involved in the sport. You know, these guys, they, they are still so much a part of who I am on the soccer field because I realized very early on um, the, the biggest difference between the, the amateur side and the professional side was, was the mental part of the game. And there's very few that are able to, to have that right when they jump out of college. Um, you know, these guys brought it every single day. You know, you're, you're fighting guys that are putting food on the table for their families. You know, it, it means a lot to them. Um, but the way that they expressed themselves on the field was unlike any I had seen before. And for me, that was a big change. Um, you know, personalities. There's more personality in the professional game than anywhere else. Um, some eccentric personalities, for sure. Um, but you have to lay it out there. You, when you play this sport, um, you have to play with your heart on your sleeve because those are the guys that change the game. Those are the guys that stick around the longest. Those are the guys that win in this sport is about winning. And so I learned that very early on from them, um, how to compete and something that I, that I still had to work on as I was going out throughout my career. Um, but they taught me at a very early age to do that. That's awesome. Your, um, your time in Toronto started in 2014. And, uh, you know, just from some of the research into this, this podcast, I understand you found out about the trade to Toronto uh, on an interesting day. Yeah, yeah. So my wife um, was from South America. She was an international business student at Notre Dame. We took some classes together. Uh, we've been together ever since. And we were getting married. We were down in Paraguay in South America, where she's from. And the day before our wedding, I keep my phone off when I'm down there. The day before my wedding, I just got an email from our from our GM that said, please call me as soon as you get this. <laughs> and so when I got it, I, I knew exactly what was happening. He told me, you know, I'm going to move on to Toronto. Uh, thank you uh, for everything that you've done here. You've been a big part of our success and whatnot. And I was thankful for them for, for letting me go to a place. Um, where I was going to have a good opportunity, but I was scared because Toronto had a really bad reputation, had a really bad reputation. I mean, players were in and out of this club in six months, coaches in and out. Um, it was just a revolving door and they were, they were still trying to find their feet within the league. And I thought, oh, man, like my career's over. I'm going to Toronto. And then a week later, um, they signed Jermaine Foe. They signed Michael Bradley and that, that called my nerves a little bit. Yeah, it's, um, you know, those early years at TFC, I, and I was intimately a part of those on the business side. It was tough. It was really tough. And, you know, you think back to that time and, and uh, you know, we didn't win a lot. Uh, we had a lot of success on, on the business in the early years, but it was about winning and that's all that mattered, right? And, and for our fans, it was something that we, we owed them. So, you know, you know, yourself, Oso, you know, you mentioned Jermaine, but Michael certainly, and then Josie Afford's like you guys, the core of what's brought our team, our team forward into a championship is, you know, starts as well with, uh, with you. So that's an important time for our organization, you know, that year specifically in, in the transition that was happening. But I want to talk about your transition as a player as well, because over the years and with different teams, you play different roles, right? Not necessarily your position as a different role, but you have to be able to maneuver to what the team needs. So in the 2017 year was our uh, unbelievable championship year. We won the um, domestic championship, which is the Canadian championship, the supporter shield, which is the regular season. And then we won the MLS cup. You had a career best year. You scored a lot of goals, which is not necessarily what, uh, what, what you're known for, but that year, you know, you were also named to best 11. What was it about that team? how you guys were made up, you know, why did, why was that an important year for you to fill in that, uh, that role specifically in something that you ne hadn't necessarily done a lot over your career? Um, I mean, when I think about that year, I would go back to what you were just talking about the, the transition pivot, pivotal moment that the club and the franchise went through. 
in 2014 because before we got to that year, we had some tough years and continued in, in 2014, um, which again, I'm sure was very successful on the business side, but we didn't make the playoffs and everyone was expecting to. It was Michael's first year. Um, Jermaine had come to the club. We started off really well, um, hit a bad patch in the summertime and, and then um, got close to the playoffs, but ultimately getting, couldn't get across the finish line. And then 2015, Seba comes, um, has an incredible year, uh, wins the MVP, sets the league on fire, and we get absolutely destroyed by Montreal Impact in the, in the first round of the playoffs, which was the first time the club had ever qualified for the playoffs. And so those years were really the building blocks of what happened in 2016 and 2017. You have to learn, you have to learn from those things. Um, and at times um, I'm seeing the common theme through, you know, when I'm studying other successful people, you have to go through rough times too and um, treat them as a learning experiences, uh, which will propel you on to the greater things that we do in life. And, and really 2016 and 2017 was the culmination of that. And even 2016, you know, losing at, at home in the final, the way that we did after having a good year and playing so well in that match, uh, whole, felt like the whole city was behind us. The whole city was at the stadium, freezing cold match. But, uh, you know, all these things set the table for 2017. And so um, the thing that is most important about 2017, it was like we wrapped up those three previous years and just, kept them right here every single game you know it was like we never forgot what we had to go through to get to the point where finally we had the right people on the bus with the mix of talent and personality to know that we were we were beating teams before we even stepped on the field um and that's a special thing to have i've, I've been on um, two of those teams in my time in major league soccer and there are players that get to play for, for 14, 15 years and never get to be on those teams. And so from being on that team in 2017, um, I just learned so much about life and things that are going to translate off the field very, very well. So that kind of leads into my my next question is, you know, the, the combination of what what builds a championship team? You know, do you do you have like, now that you've gone through it, and you understand, you know, what 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 is what is made up different teams, whether you've had success or not success. Is there anything that you would say, you know, in the future as you build whatever whatever life is after football, whenever your career is done, like what for you are the ingredients that build a successful championship organization team? Have you been able to distill that down, you know, coming through your playing career? Yeah. Um, there are a couple of very important things. And for me, it starts with cohesion at the top. Um, you know, whether it's a sports franchise or um, a franchise in some type of an industry, apart from that, uh, the people that are leading really need to have um, a very good understanding of each other. They all need to be on the same page and they need to have a plan. Um, and not necessarily a vision because I've seen it play out in, in the short term. And I've seen it play out in the long term. And sometimes it doesn't matter which plan you have for that and the time frame, but you need to have some type of plan. Um, then you need to be able to communicate that plan efficiently down to everyone that's going to be engaging and, and working and be a part of the team and be able to get that buyback into the plan and be able to, to communicate that very well, how to execute and whatnot. And then um, you need to have the, the right mix of talent and personality. And I think that comes down to knowing who's on the bus. And when, I, when I talk about 2014, 2015, the things that we went through, you re, when you go through it at hard times, you really understand who, who needs to be there and who doesn't need to be there. And that comes down to talent just as much as personality. Obviously, you need people that are capable to, to fill roles, fill jobs. But for me, if I was um, in a position of leadership, I want to surround myself with people of character and people of personality, people that are willing to go above and beyond, express themselves in different ways, uh, because those are the those are the people that make things special. 
And I think in 2017, um, 2016, we had a lot of those people on our team. You know, and the, the translation into the business world is, is, is obviously the same, right? It's, it's, you know, building championship teams takes something special. Um, <clears throat> for, for, for us and for me, the, the vision piece it is, is it's interesting you mentioned there, you know, you've seen it with vision and, and some, you know, short term with, without the longer vision. And as I reflect back on, you know, Toronto FC over the years, specifically being so close to it, you know, over this last phase, we've had that championship vision. And for us, it's maybe it's a feeling or a sense when you step into the training facility, to the BMO training ground, you know, what that means depicted through imagery, trophies, you know, a sense of winning and championship. And I'll say through my early years at the club, we didn't necessarily have that. And you didn't have that, that feeling, right? So I think it comes in a lot of different ways and it's interpreted a number of different ways, either through leadership or through the different people that work within the organization or, or players, for example. So interesting to see the perspective uh, on that one for sure. So transitioning now to current time, okay? The, the pandemic, um, March 11th of last year, crazy to think it's a year ago yeah. in a couple of days um we you know we all remember the time when when uh, rudy gobert for, for us it was the nba right that really kind of set things at, you know in the next cadence of of what was going to happen but you know rudy gobert test positive and then the next day we all found ourselves at bmo field and we were doing a training session downtown in advance of you know one of our our upcoming matches a few days later we're typically up at the training ground but we moved everything downtown so we were all around and we're all wondering what to do and where are we gonna train? Where are we not gonna train? What does this mean? I'm curious to hear from, a, from your standpoint, from a player's standpoint, you know, what, what some of the thoughts and, and you know, the next few days uh, felt like from, from you guys. I mean, it's still hard to put into words the, the feelings then, you know, it was, it was unlike anything ever before. I mean, the, <laughs> we've been talking about this recently within the team just because it's it's been the year anniversary we've been at the stadium and whatnot and it seems like everything's come come full circle in a way um i'll just never forget the actual conversations that i was having in that moment i'll never forget um you know you talk about the nba i'll never forget the mark cuban you know the video when he's he's sitting on the sidelines at the at the maps team and he reads his phone and he, and he sees the news and his jaw just drops like I'm, i'll never forget that image i'll never forget ruby gobert um and then i'll never forget the the few days afterwards because um nobody knew what to expect um, nobody knew if it was going to be a couple weeks a couple months a year multiple years uh, but those first couple of days felt like a very long time. And we stayed in touch as much as we could um, through Zooms and, and text chats and whatnot, phone calls. Um, and, and then as time gone on, um, I think emotionally the, the stress levels were very high because um, – you know, nobody was figuring out anything anytime soon. No, no answers were coming and everybody was waiting on that. Uh, we're used to, to seeing each other week in and week out, playing against each other, competing. Um, and then we start going through these CB, CBA negotiations with the league to try to return to play. Uh, so apart from the very beginning of the pandemic and the first couple of weeks that we, that we stood there, was at a standstill, a pause, that's what I remember most. I remember, I remember the conversations about the CBA and I remember the death of George Floyd and everything that came after that. The, the, um, and we're going to get a lot into, uh, into that in a, in a few minutes, the, the added pressure as well of being a player needing to stay fit and train, take care of your family. Right. We talked earlier about the mental toughness and, and whatnot. Um, that's certainly got to wear on on you guys, because at some point you're going to be expected to be playing and you're going to be expected. So, you know, add that into the mix. Right. It's just a whole lot of a lot of factors coming in, coming into play there. Leading into the MLS's back tournament. So MLS had a few different phases of the schedule. Right. We had a couple games before the pandemic. We had this period of time where we're figuring things out. 
you know, you talked about some of those, some of those things, the, the PA negotiations, et cetera. And then we've got the MLS's back tournament uh, and, and getting into that. Uh, we're, yeah. we're a Canadian team and the challenge is being a, a Canadian team, you know, going through, going through last year. And then we get into post MLS's back tournament where we play a series of games in Toronto. And then after that, we're down to Hartford, Connecticut, you know, a year certainly yeah. like, like no other. And as you guys are still competing and competing for a supporter shield and pushing, pushing as hard as you can, I just love to hear, you know, in, in your words about how you kept it all together, despite the obstacles and, and the challenges, because, you know, we, we don't like to make excuses, but the reality is, is the Canadian clubs faced a lot more challenges last year than your American counterparts and you still had success. Yeah. Um, our group has, has been together through a lot of different things. Um, and I think that helped out a lot. You know, I think there was times where we were looking at each other last year, like, you know, our, is this happening? Nine, 9 a.m. games, in Florida in the middle of the summer. Um, and when you're a part of the team, you know, going through different journeys is, is a part of it, you know, and I think we embrace that. We we're like, all right, this is another thing for us. This will be another thing for us to talk about when we're 60 years old and we're getting together over a glass of wine. And we can tell the stories about how we did battle <laughs> in Florida at the MLS's back tournament or how we had to go to Hartford. Um, but the thing with our team is, is because we have those types of personalities and because we have that perspective, um, you know, we expect to win. Doesn't, doesn't matter what's happening around us. Uh, we control what we can control and we go out there to win the game. And we're very confident in each other. And we know that when, when we're performing at our best, uh, we're top in this league. And so that's the attitude that, that we bring towards everything. And yeah, I think the times where it's the hardest is um, when you're not playing um, and there, you can think about it, but the playing part was kind of the, the respite, you know, to, to forget about everything else and just be normal, almost normal for a little bit. You know, I, I'll never, I'll never um, take away the element of not playing in front of the fans because that for me was, was the biggest part of it. And that was a level playing, almost a level playing field for all the teams. You know, some teams are playing in their home stadiums with, with limited amount of fans, but for the majority of teams are, are playing without fans. Um, and for me, that was, that was the big kicker because sports without fans is, is not the same. It's almost nothing, you know? And I, I get what benefit it does for society when you're in a pandemic and there's nothing to watch for fans at home to have sports. Um, but for us to play the game without fans, it's a it's a big detraction from the game. And so for me, that was that was the toughest part of it and and being in Hartford and, and playing those games. But for us, when I'm you know, on the field with my brother that I've been battling with for for so many years, um, we were, we're going out there to win. I think we did a very good job of that last year. I think, you know, that. The comments about not playing with fans and and I'm on the flip side, you know, where, where you guys are battling on the pitch and I'm trying to figure out on the business side, you know, what are we going to do to engage the fans and still make them feel like they're at BMO field. The image behind you right now is, is an empty BMO field, but on game days, it's unlike anything else in our city and, and across major league soccer as well. So how do we replicate an environment? How do we make fans feel like they're still connected and close to the team? You know, that's everything we've been trying to figure out on, on the business side. And we continue to, you know, as we're going into our second year like this, you know, how do we, how do we make our fans close and, and feel like they, they should still be there? I was having a meeting with one of our supporters the other day, and they just started to talk about the arrival at BMO Field and the sense of what that means and the smells and the sounds. But yeah. what, he really, what he really honed in on was as the game is playing, there's this level of hum in the venue that, it's not produced by any sort of, you know, it's not produced by somebody in game presentation doing whatever. It's just the hum of a soccer crowd that is different yeah. than anything else. And yes, those times when a goal is scored or there's an opportunity, you know, it, get, it gets up to here. But that hum that exists when it's just the regular 
regular play. And it brought me back to a point where I'm like, yeah, man, we all, we all miss that. We all feel it, but it's those nuances that you try and we try and connect, you know, how do we get fans closer to that, even though we're not at the venue. So it's, it's certainly not easy, but uh, that's the battle that we're, we're going through on the, on the business side as well. Definitely not easy at all. I match. So we'll, we'll transition now into your work as the executive director uh, at black players for change. And, you know, certainly May 25th, when George Floyd was, was murdered, um, you know, the, the world change and, and whether it was sports, whether it was, you know, you know, the social justice movement, um, the battle for equality, there's so many different areas um, where the world changed on, on that specific day. Um, but I'd love to just get into the conversations that you started to have with your fellow players, the team, um, I think it was different. It's, it's different than it's ever been before, right? And, and, you know, we want this con conversation to continue over and over again. But those few days afterwards, I know there was some, some important moments um, for you as, as players and as a team where you guys came together and had those, those conversations. So if you can take us a little bit into, into that. Yeah, I was talking a little bit earlier about um, the CBA negotiations, the return to play negotiations, trying to figure out um, going to the bubble. And just like right at the crescendo of those negotiations was the death of George Floyd. And so we were like all very emotional due to the pandemic, due to the stress of trying to go negotiate the CBA. And then on top of that, George Floyd gets killed. Or, you know, I'm up here in Canada and I'm, I'm just watching on television. Um, seeing cities burned down, seeing people take to the streets. Um, I'll never forget our peers in Minnesota uh, describing to us the scenes of the streets in Minnesota, other cities as well. You know, we have guys actually in these cities like living through this stuff. Um, and so the emotions were crazy. And, and um, we got together pretty quickly and, and decided that we were going to try and do something. And what was that going to look like? What form was that going to take? And eventually we decided on an organization that was going to be about what we could do about the situation. Um, you know, what influence did we have? How could we pull our platform together to, to make some type of change? Because we were all called to a, to a point at that time. And so we decided on the organization, um, you know, we wanted to push the league and some hiring practices and, and you know, push their influence and see what they could do. We wanted to get involved in our communities, but the most important thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to be us. We wanted to be unapologetic. We wanted to be organic because we felt like um, lots of companies were just, you know, putting out performative statements. They were, they were, were um, putting out social media posts and whatnot. And we did, we were like, no, this isn't going to be enough. And we don't want anyone speaking on our behalf. If anyone's going to do something around this topic, it's going to be us and we're going to do it the way we want. And so we've continued to do that. Um, we started in the, in the MLS back tournament with the protests that we did there. Um, we've been on this trail of initiatives and, and influence in a lot of different areas that I can tell you about. And in some ways it's been, it's been really successful and in other ways it's been a real uphill climb and it will continue to be because we're fighting systemic racism which was built over hundreds and hundreds of years. And so that's not gonna change overnight and, and none of us believe that it, that it will. Um, but we know that you know, we're not going away. And I like that you said that it feels different because it is different this time because we're, we're not going away. And we've built this thing for the next generation so that they can have some some entryway into it. And then just connecting with other athletes that are doing the same thing has been really special as well. And I think that's what, what makes it different this time. You know, really, it's the age of, of activism in sports and it'll be very well documented by the time this is all over. Yeah. So, so you have the initial conversations, there's large groups of players, and then you emerge as, as the leader of this group. So you're a full-time player, and now you're basically taking on a full-time role as the executive director in this nonprofit. And you've got a, a group of directors that are they're doing a lot of work. How does Justin Morrow wrap his head around that and, and you know, balance the playing piece as well as the important initiative that you've, you've got here? 
<laughs> I don't think I've ever wrapped my head around it. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was a lot very fast. I think the thing that, that always sticks out to me and that I, that I highlight every single time I'm talking is that I was chosen and elected into the position that I'm in now, but I didn't start the organization. We started it as a group. You know, we started it as a, a group of, of black men that were underrepresented, that were backed into a corner that felt like this was something that we had to do. And then um, the group decided on me to be the leader. And that is an honor that I never take for granted. I never take it lightly. Um, you know, when, when there are some guys doing work, there are some guys not doing work. Um, I never hold that against anyone because I know that first and foremost, our job is to be a professional athlete and to, to win. Um, but I know that with my business experience and my experience within the league, my relationships with guys within the league and whatnot, that I can, I can be that glue. Um, I can hold it together for, for everyone else. I can set the vision. I can help guide and execute what these guys' ideas are because I think that's, that's the most important part. And, and so that's what we've been doing. You know, that's what we've been doing in, uh, in a lot of different ways. And it's been really tough at times. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. It's been, it's been, tough nights um but there's also been really good nights you know and and the days when it's tough it's easy to think about all of those that have come before me and blazed a much harder path before me and that always that always calms me down to know that if i lost a battle on that day that i didn't lose the war because really the war is never going to end until we, we topple this thing you know as um as athletes or as clubs leagues you know we have a voice and we have a platform to to communicate that and and work against social injustice and, and racism and you know it's our hope that other organizations you know step up as well and and take action and one thing that we were at mlsc we've been very you know cognizant of is you know yes we can communicate we can tell a story but what does the action piece look like and you and i have talked about that a lot in our organization as we as we start to go deeper, we're gonna we're gonna start to to invest a lot more into programs that are gonna um, help with a number of different whether it's initiatives or you know, we're always gonna tell tell the story and talk about um, battling racism. But what are we doing to invest into that as well? So hopefully other sports teams, clubs, right across the you know U.S. and and, and Canada, will continue to to invest in that space. But racism exists everywhere and football in Europe and we had a you know an instance in the last number of days in, in France as well where there's different reports that's going to exist is there work that you are doing with any of your counterparts across the globe uh, or your organization is is starting to think about um, in tackling some of those issues in 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 broader football not just here in, in major league soccer yeah, and I, and I mentioned in the beginning, like, it's been so special to be connected to, to all different professional athletes, even over in Europe, um, some of these guys in the Premier League, um, taking notice of what they're doing, but then being in touch with them is a whole different thing, and, and they look to us, you know, they're looking up to us right now because their climate is a whole different thing, you know, they're in a whole other stratosphere, and they're you know, each one of those players is like their own universe, right? They, with the gravity at which they attract a bunch of different people, a bunch of different things, and a bunch of different attention and media and press and all these things. And so um, they're looking to us like, wow, you know, these guys are really stepping up in a unified way. Um, what could we do? And so talking through all of that with them, um, letting them know how things are going for us, continuing to be in touch um, helps them a little bit. I think when the time is right, we'll, we'll all come together on the same page, but it's been really inspiring to be in touch with them and, and all the other professional athletes and fighting this fight together. Cause like I said before, that's, that's the most special part about, about it. And it's happening now more than it ever has before. And the NBA, I mean, you, you even did some work with the NBA as they were, you know, into their, into their playoffs. Uh, as well. So, you know, that, that, that movement and the conversation continues to happen. So it's great that, you know, MLS players specifically in the work you're doing is, is starting to, uh, you know, transpire across the other sports. 
Can we talk a little bit about the, the actionable items that you guys have gotten into? Because in a very short period of time, your organization has created some partnerships and you've, you've dedicated some mini pitch legacy programs. And you've also most recently worked with Adidas on a program. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, uh, about that and some of the work you've already put into place a short few months into uh, the existence of Black Players for Change. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I'm, I mean, I, I won't have time to go through all of them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you um, some good ones. You know, the very beginning, the very first thing that we did uh, was this protest in the MLS's back tournament. And so we had a player named Warren Cabal play for the Philadelphia Union, uh, played here in Toronto for the first time before that. And he's a clothing designer. He owns his own brand named Cabal. Um, all the players, you know, know about it. Uh, very popular with the player pool. And so we had him commissioned to, to make shirts. He made shirts for us for the protest that we wore just for our group for the protest. And then he made um, shirts for the league that say Black Lives Matter on the front, some, some designs on the back, um, MLS on one side, Adidas on the other side. And, you know, going through that whole process um, was, was a big learning moment for all of us of, of what it's like and a license and deal to put that together, all the different constituents, different parties, all the different things to get something like that up for sale. Um, so that was a that was a big learning point for us when you're talking about business, because um, on top of all of these initiatives that we're doing, being impactful in our communities and, and society, um, Black Players for Change has created this unique thing in that you know, guys that want business experience are getting it firsthand like never before. Um, so I just mentioned that because, you know, we're talking about marketing, we're talking about business and all the things and how it, it translates because all of these initiatives that we're doing are, are baked in with each other in that sense. So we got that shirt um, up for sale on the Adidas website, on the club websites, on Warren's website. And that was a big jumping off point for us because on top of our original announcement, on top of our protests, which garnered a lot of attention, um, everybody wanted these t-shirts, everybody wanted t-shirts and so um we got those up for sale the money was to be split between three organizations uh, players coalition 100 black men of america 100 black women of america and all the money was to go to them um i just got the numbers back from from all the way through q1 through 2021 right now and we sold on like 126 thousand dollars worth of awesome products for that so that was for those organizations. So that's that right off the bat was huge for us. Um, after that, um, we hooked up with the NBA guys. The NBA guys saw that we were in the bubble, saw what we did, uh, wanted to be a part of it. We tried for a while to to do something together because we were we were like a mile away from them, maybe not even. Um, on the Disney complex and it was just impossible with the COVID restrictions. It was impossible. It was never going to happen. So we got an idea of, of doing a video together. Um, and that was our first, well, our second content video that we had did again, the business experience, understanding what it, you know, what goes into to making content like that. Um, and it was a very long experience you know very long drawn out process much longer than we thought it was going to be but um we thought we were going to put it out when we were both there at the bubble and uh, didn't work out that way but we were able to pivot and, and make it towards voting which was perfect because right after we did that we jumped into the civic engagement piece and we created um, an initiative to get our player pool engaged in voting and, and registering to vote in the american election last year and so we were doing a bunch of things. We were getting stadiums open as polling places. We were linking up with LeBron and, and more than a boat um, to help his team out and spread it across the rest of the professional athletes. So we, we pivoted with the NBA video. We made that about voting. We created a separate video with more than a boat, um, which players were filming in their stadiums. Again, the business side of it, understanding what it, you, know, you have to clear stuff legally, you have to do this. Um, and we're putting out content on initiatives. 
And all the while, throughout all of this, uh, we were doing strategic partnerships. And our very first and, and biggest strategic partnership was with U.S. Soccer Foundation. And that is important to us because it'll be forever a pillar of our organization, which is creating access to the game. You know, the sport here in North America is dominated by um, this pay-to-play model, uh, which often excludes minorities. And we want to change that. We don't think that we're going to be the ones to break the system, but um, in the meantime, we can find ways to fit underneath the system and create access for people, which is what this, this mini pitch idea does. We, we build mini pitches in underserved communities. Um, it's free to play, free to, free to come on the field. It comes with after school programming, safe place to play. And we were able to get our first one done in Newark, New Jersey. Um, that happened around September, October of last year. Um, so we're doing all of these fantastic things, um, initiatives, and we're building out the organization. We built a nonprofit. Um, so we're just doing so much, you know, and, and that's on the initiative side because we're still politicking and lobbying with the league about what we're going to do as a league and how we're going to build on the representation that we currently have and how we're gonna affect from the top to the bottom of the North American ecosystem. When you're talking about soccer at the grassroots level up and at the leadership down. Um, so we just have our hands in, in so many different things um, off the top of my head. Those are, those are some of the most in, impactful things that we've done so far. Uh, ton, tons of important work. Uh, being done and you know we're, we're proud of the work you're doing and uh, as a club but uh, you should be you should be proud and, and your family as well and and everybody is following along and and uh, watching what uh, what's next so uh, certainly exciting stuff transition into um, maybe the last segment here and just talk about yourself as you mentioned earlier a, a lifelong learner and when you and I first started to talk a little bit more and you had a lot of questions for me at the start and you were you know, picking my brain just about the business and whatnot, but you were taking a unique course. It was a crossover into business course designed specifically for professional athletes uh, at the Harvard Business School. And uh, you were beside you know, professional tennis players, uh, NFL players, NBA players. I think former Toronto Raptor Jose Calderon was part of, yeah. part of the program as well. We just love to hear about uh, about your experience in in that class and and uh, how it's helped you get to this point. Yeah, that that class was amazing. I'm so glad that I was able to be a part of that. It reinvigorated me um, because while I was playing, I I kept up my education in a lot of different ways. Like I said, I, I have this growth mindset. I want to leave everything better than, than when I got there, you know, that's my goal and everything in life, leave this world better than, than when I came. And you can do that a lot of different ways, but you're going to need tools, you're going to need resources and knowledge is, is the biggest one of those. So I try and pick it up in any way that I can read books, watching documentaries. My wife always gives me a hard time because she's an avid reader too, but um, she reads fiction and I read nonfiction. She's like, I don't know how you can, how you can read that. I'm like, oh, I read like 10 pages a night, you know, but <laughs> it takes a little longer, <laughs> but it's good. It's, it's up here. And so um, anyways, throughout my career, I was thinking that I was going to get back into finance. I thought I was going to get back strictly into banking um, because that excites me as well. And so when I took this course, it was really the first time where I got this idea of like, oh, you know, I can marry these two things because now I've been in the league a decade. So I have experience here too. You know, I, I have business experience here on the player side and, and understanding the mechanisms, understanding what it, you know, being a part of a professional sports league, what that means and how it's run. Um, how can I marry my passion for business with that so that I'm not just giving up on that experience? Um, and that's, at that Harvard course, that's where they really molded together because the, the course that I was taking was sports media and entertainment. It's put on by this, this wonderful professor. Her name is Anita Elvers, and she, you know, her class is famous throughout the world with professional athletes um, come to visit her. She, she's friends with all the, you know, most famous professional athletes you can imagine. Um, and she's putting on this course, which is her normal course for Harvard Business School. She she replicates it for professional athletes. And so I was able to, to travel to the university for a couple of days. Um, I met her. I met 
other fantastic athletes, like Chris was saying. Um, but the most important thing was, was the knowledge that I was learning, which is, you know, about sports and media and how those two worlds can come together. We studied LeBron and, and Spring Hill Entertainment and how he's, you know, changing the, the media landscape with his production company. Um, I learned about Nike and how they are increasing profit margin by selling direct to consumer through different apps that they own now. Um, we've, we studied um, different individuals like Jay-Z and, and D Wade and how they put together strategic partnerships at different points in their career and how, um, you know, maybe early on in your career, you're going after long-term contracts versus that, you know, end of career, you're going after more money because you don't know where the money's going to be coming after you're done playing and really like trying to fit in a bunch of different um, companies under one umbrella and, and different interests there. So it was just some really interesting stuff. Studied the studied the NFL media rights and, and MLB kind of stuff that they're doing there. So it was really the first time where I was like, whoa, you can, you can put these two together and it's really fascinating as well. And so, you know, that kind of reinvigorated me on this path to, you know, like that's what I, that's what I want to do for sure. When I'm done. I'm gonna continue to be a part of the sport, continue to be a part of growing soccer here in North America on the business side, because it just has so much more to go. It has so much more to go. Everyone sees the potential and it's been my passion for, for such a long time. So I don't want to, uh, I'll never leave it. You know, I'll, in some type of capacity, I'll, I'll move on from the business side, but I'm never going to leave it. You know, it, um, <clears throat> you know, when we started to talk about that and, and, you know, even, even preparing for this and, you know, I think a club plays a role as well in some of that, you know, how does a club prepare some of, you know, the athletes for life after sport and, and to the extent, what does that, what, what does that look like? And I think, you know, there's some some space and areas of improvement that we can we can kind of pull from that uh, as an organization. You know, I would say especially for some of our our teams that you know we've got some teams that are you know multimillionaire athletes and they've got you know a business that they've already you know they're already cured, um through through their through their time. And then we've got you know soccer and we've got Canadian football and you know uh, our development teams below that as well. Um, so I think there's a space there for, for clubs and in, in how they're you know, helping to support some of the athletes as they come through. So it's certainly, certainly interesting. I'd like to transition to the last piece here and just talk about, you know, as you are, you know, and maybe you can either from an athlete standpoint or from, you know, a business executive standpoint, you know, a lot of the people that are going to listen to this podcast are, you know, aspiring either to get into the sports industry, get into business, whatever, whatever it might be. And as you are, you know, looking at teammates or you're, or you're thinking about, you know, people that are coming into, you know, either work for your organization or people that you want to associate with, with your organization, you know, what are some of those characteristics that you're looking for? And it could be, you know, young up and comers that are looking to break into the into industry or, you know, young players. What are those things that stand out to you that, you know, you always want to see? I mean, I think... I talked about this a couple of times before on the podcast um, in our discussion, just personality and two very important characteristics are charisma and perseverance. I think this idea of failure, um, I've learned a lot about it throughout my career because there's through any professional athlete's career, you have the ups and the downs. Um, but if you're, if you're getting up and you're able to play the next day, there's no, you know, failure doesn't exist because you always have a chance to, to do better the next day. And I learned that in, in some tough ways throughout my career. Um, you know, when I think about 2016 and, and missing the penalty kick in the MLS cup, um, that one always weighs heavily on my mind, but I, I bounced back the next year and had a really good year. Uh, won a lot of trophies with the club. And so now I remember that more than I'll ever remember 2016, you know, for, for what it was. Um, you have to have that. You have to have that ability to, to continue on, to know that um, as long as you have the opportunity to, to be there, to be present and to be better than you were the next day, um, that you're going to persevere. And I think the people 
in my career that I've watched that that have kind of faded away didn't have that. You know, they weren't able to to mentally get past the tough days, and it's a skill. It's a skill, but um, it's an important skill. And then on the other side is is charisma. You know what what extra thing are you bringing to the table? Because quite honestly, there's you know there's lots of people that can that can do an average job, but how do you do above average job? How do you do an extra ordinary job? Uh, usually that's that's being done by people with charisma, people that have an energy about them, people that attract other people to them that can that can get them to do and buy in to what they want to do. Um, and maybe that's not your way, because for me, that that wasn't my way. Um, I mean, you know, talk about leadership and, and what form does that take? I've, I've never been the loudest guy in the locker room, um, but I know my form of leadership and I know what that took. And I understood myself very well and nobody did my role better than, than I did. And I took very much pride in that. So, you know, these are the ideas of, of, of charisma that I'm talking about, so understanding yourself, understanding that special thing that you can bring to your job or your role um, that's going to galvanize everyone else around you and make them want to be around you and, and pick you every single time. You know, and then part of a job as a leader, whether it's a veteran on a team or a, or a boss, is to recognize, well, this person made it for a reason. They're here. And it's my job as a leader to develop them to that next level, to that next step and what makes them special. And, you know, the ability to, to coach someone along and bring them along to be the next, you know, Justin Morrow or whoever it might be is, is vitally important. And you don't, you're, you're not a, a veteran in the league or in business without having the ability to, uh, to accomplish that. So, you know, you, today we've talked a, a ton about leadership, about building championship teams, building organizations from the ground up. Uh, it's really been a, a great discussion. So um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of uh, Ryerson University and on behalf of uh, Dr. Sherry Bradish, who is the, the course leader here. Um, appreciate your time, Justin. I know uh, you're balancing so many different things. So for taking an hour to do this, much, uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Chris. Anytime. Appreciate you.